um, cause it's 10 o'clock and let me pull this over here. So, uh, we are live audio and video is up and running. Um, right off the bat, you can probably see it's a little different. Um, the camera angle is a bit different for those of you that are, uh, that can see the camera. Um, what we're doing today is our live demo of Risa. And we're going to do, this is the first of two uh, demos that we're going to do. Um, so I want to get through some logistics first. Uh, first off, um, I want to pull something up on Teams. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the Teams channel for the class. And if you notice, I posted a poll in, um, in Teams where I wanted you to identify what operating system you use. Some of you responded via a comment. Um, but if you could do me a favor and respond to the poll, that would be great. In fact, if you could take a minute and do it now, that would be great. Because um, for those of you that are operating uh, uh, Apple products, I, I need to do some workarounds to get you access to the, to the, uh, the uh, a remote computer here at Marshall, and I want to I want to work through that. Um, but I, I, the more info, the better. So if you could respond to that, like within you know, like now, that that would be great. Just Go to the poll and select Windows or Mac. That, that would be great. Okay. I um, also want to talk a little bit about the um, – Is there no, or do you not see a poll on the, the, the general page? So you sh uh, if you go to the general on, uh, at the bottom, do you not see this? I'll tell you what, um, okay, all right. Yeah, uh, you might have to scroll through the, the general channel a bit, but if you uh, if you can find that, please do me a favor. Yeah, I see somebody already responded. Yeah, do me a favor and do that, because I need to know how many of you are operating Apple products to uh, to get your remote access. Okay, I also want to talk about the homework. This homework is going to be a, a little different. Um, uh, let me actually close my team so that I'm not... Um, bother during class. Okay, um, I want to uh, talk about the homework because it's going to be different. I'm not going to, so we're going to have Risa for two lectures, but I'm not going to assign two homeworks. I'm only going to assign one. So you're going to get one homework assignment that's due Monday, and it's going to be two Risa analysis problems. And I'll probably pull that up at the end of class to kind of clarify what's going on. Uh, but just wanted to make sure everybody is aware of that. Okay, what we're going to do today is this. If you go to the YouTube series, um, you'll find that I posted a recording called a Risa Primer. And the idea behind that recording is I've got this slideshow here, and I go through some of the basics of Risa, uh, things about modeling the geometry, modeling the boundary conditions, the loads, uh, all that stuff. And what I want to do with you all in class is I want to interactively build a model together. Uh, in order to do that, I'm probably going to be hopping back and forth between the slides and the program a bit. Um, so the idea behind that primer is that's me going through the slides in an uninterrupted fashion. So if there's anything that you miss during lecture, if there's a command that you need explained, that, that video is probably a pretty good resource to go through all of the things that we might go back and forth a bit. I'm going to try and reduce the back and forth as much as possible, but I will probably pull the slides uh, up a bit as we're building the model. Okay, let me say a couple things about RISA. So RISA, first up, you know, in the world of structural analysis, there's a number of computer programs out there that will do structural analysis for you. The question is, which one do you use? And I'm not really married to one particular package. I mean, I show you RISA in class, and next thing you know, you all go and get a job, and they use Bentley Stad Pro or uh, some, some other package or, or, or what have you. And um, really, from my perspective, I just want you to have a general understanding how some of these packages work, because if you have an idea behind how one package works, you can usually work your way through how any program works, because they all operate off of the same mathematical principles, which we'll hopefully have time to discuss near the end of the semester. Um, I like RISA from a classroom perspective because it's very easy. Uh, of all the programs that are out there, I found that RISA is the one that has the very uh, that doesn't have a very steep learning curve. Um, you, it's useful from analysis perspective and from a design perspective. And so after today, what you're going to be able to do is this stuff. Or maybe I'll maybe I can draw a little bit of a better box. Um, today, 
uh, you'll be able to determine for statically determinate structures, and I want to key in on that, for determinate structures, you'll be able to determine support reactions, you'll be able to look at trusses, shear and moment diagrams, all of that, all of the force response. Um, we're limited to determinate structures because one of the things we're not going to talk about today is how to define materials and section sets. And you need that in order to properly compute deflections as well as to analyze indeterminate structures. The nice thing about uh, RISA and, and these programs is they really don't care whether or not the, uh, the structure is determinant or indeterminate. They'll analyze it the, the same way. But in order to properly analyze an indeterminate structure, you need to define not just the geometry, the boundary condition, the loading, uh, but you need the materials and the, the, the stiffness properties uh, to be correct as well. And so we'll handle that part uh, on Friday. Um, Instead of going through all of these slides with you together, um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to open RISA and let, let's talk a little bit about it. So here's RISA. Let me open this up. Uh, so when you open it up, there's a little dialog box that pops up. Um, we're using the demo in here, so we're going to be limited to like 20 joints or members, but that's, that's not going to be a problem for what we're doing in here. I just want you to, once you know how to build a model, you can pretty much build uh, any model. Uh, so let's hit OK. Uh, and here's the program that uh, that pops up. And so first thing it does is there's this dialog box that says starting a model. You can you know, go through tutorials and all of that. I'm just going to close this and just go right to the uh, uh, the, the basic uh, interface. Um, the the long and short of RISA, if I could, you know, uh, sum it up in one you know, key aspect. But as soon as you open RISA, you're going to see this thing right here. This is your data entry toolbar. Uh, by the way, if you accidentally close it, so let's say I close it, oh no, what do I do? Uh, up here on the top, you see like file, edit, settings, units. If you go to spreadsheets, right here, spreadsheets, and click the first one, there it is. So uh, that might be something to write down because it's it's really easy when you're building a model to forget to close it and go, oh no, what do I do? Um, but if I could sum up uh, uh, using Risa in one phrase, it would be this. This is your data entry toolbar, and if you start at the top and work your way down, defining the stuff that's pertinent to your model, once you get to the bottom and you complete it, your model's done and it's ready to analyze. So you can start at the top uh, and work your way down. Now, this is a structural analysis class, uh, and because of the the, uh, the models that typical civil engineers uh, use, at least you know in the context of our class, there's a couple of options that we're not going to deal with. So, for example, let me pull this uh, over here. So, we're not going to use uh, member design rules or wall design rules because this is an analysis class. We're not really worried about design perspectives. Um, RISA will allow you to define uh, uh, footings uh, if you want. We're not going to worry about that. Uh, we're also not going to worry about plates or wall panels, and we're also not going to worry about moving loads. So, we're going to we're going to skip those. As for the materials and the section sets. We're going to start with that on uh, on Friday. So today we're kind of going to skip that. And so we're actually going to jump straight into joint coordinates. So uh, we're going to jump into to joint coordinates, boundary conditions and members, and then get into loads. Um, basically, uh, you know, when it's all said and done, uh, in order to define a, a model, you really need to define two components, at least for a basic model. You need to define the geometry of the structure, and then you need, you need to define the loads on the structure. Um, before we get into that, though, I want to talk a little bit about the interface, just a couple of things that are, that are worth mentioning. First off, there's a lot of buttons here, and, I, and I'm sure when you first open it, it can seem kind of uh, uh, intimidating. Uh, first off, you know, for, for building not just simple models, but really advanced models, a lot of these buttons you'll never use. But think of these these buttons and these uh, 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 options here on the top as just shortcuts for the spreadsheets that we're going to use, and, and that'll become clear uh, here in a little bit. Um, there's a couple things that are worth mentioning. Uh, for instance, if you look here up top, you can see this thing that says units or this uh, inches, uh, millimeters button. If you click either one, it brings up this dialog box, and it allows you to change the unit system to whatever you want. You can work in imperial units. You can work in metric units. You can change one of these to you know, whatever you prefer, and it will automatically convert any of the existing data uh, that you already have built into the model. So if you're building the model and you decide halfway through you want to work in metric, you can change it, and you can see right here, convert existing data for any unit changes. It will convert everything. Um, so that, that's a pretty nifty tool. We'll just use standard Imperial, uh, but 
just just so you know you have that option this uh, globe button right here this is a globe button this is the global model settings this covers some stuff that uh that you know you can tinker around with in terms of how risa analyzes a structure one thing that's worth mentioning if you go to solution risa automatically considers shear deformation so if you're doing a problem by hand and then you run it in risa and there's a slight difference it might be because shear deformations are wrong you can turn those off and then see how it affects your answer um i'm gonna skip past a lot of other uh, a lot of that other stuff because like the codes and so on and so forth um you can peruse that you know uh, at your leisure i really want to get into just the, the grunt work of of building a model um now like i said uh in order to build a model you really need two things you need the geometry and you need the loads okay and so i'm going to take that one step at a time uh and in order to do that i think we need kind of a, a, a concrete example no pun intended to work off of so i'm going to work off of this problem right here this is a problem this is, we did this problem in class we computed the reactions for, for this beam in class so um i figure you know let's use something that we're familiar with um so what i want to do is i want to define the geometry i want to define the boundary conditions the loads and i want to analyze this beam with you start to finish okay so let's talk a little bit about this beam we have an overhanging beam it's got a uh Hinge support, a hinge support at A, it has a roller support at B. We have a triangular load, we have a uniformly distributed load, and then we have this point load uh, that's somewhat uh, in the middle. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna build this model start to finish. I'm gonna start with the joint coordinates. Now, the joint coordinates are just that, the, the X and Y coordinates of the key points that define the geometry on the structure. Um, now, here's the thing, um, we could, model this a number of different ways uh and what i mean by that is we could define as many joints as we want what i want to try and do is is model this as easily as possible in order to define the structure i propose we need at least three joints we need a joint here a joint here and a joint here um, we need a joint at a and b uh, because the joint at A and B is where the boundary conditions are. So at a minimum, you need a joint everywhere that you have a boundary condition. Uh, you also need a joint that defines the endpoints of your members. So that's why we need those three. And so the question then becomes, well, hold on, Dr. Mike, do I need a joint here or do I need a joint there? Uh, the answer is no, and, and that'll become clear with how we load members later. Um, you can place a joint there if you want. It makes your model a little more inefficient, but in linear analysis, you'll still get the same answer, so it really won't matter. Um, let me uh, let me go into uh, uh, modeling the the these joints. Now, in order to model these joints, um, we need x and y coordinates for these points. Okay, and in order to define the uh, the geometry, we, we need to pick an origin. Now, Risa doesn't care. You could put the origin here. You could, uh, let's see, you could put the origin here, you could put it here, you could put it here, you could put it wherever you want, and, and you know, uh, uh, Risa wouldn't care. You could put it there, you could put it there, you could put it wherever. Um, what I'm going to do is define the origin uh, at A, uh, and defining the origin at A, you start to look at this, okay, if this is an X, Y plot, what would be the coordinates of each of these points? And so point A, it would have the coordinates 0, 0. Uh, point B would have the coordinates 30, 0. And then this point over here, we'll call it point C, would have the coordinates, uh, what is that, 52, 0. Again, you can do that however you want. Just, you know, make sure that you're being consistent. So I'll go into joint coordinates. And as soon as you pull, uh, press that joint coordinates button, it brings up a spreadsheet. And every one of these uh, uh, buttons will bring up a spreadsheet associated with what you're trying to define. And so once you enter the spreadsheet, the first thing you'll do is you'll start pressing enter. And as you press enter, you'll see um, uh, an option to define that, that given joint. And so I need to define three joints. So I'll press enter once, twice, three times. Now, here's a keyboard shortcut for you. What happens if I press enter too many times and I've got too many definitions? Oh no, what do I do? If you hit the F4 key on your uh, keyboard, F4, F4 will delete a row. Okay, so you can you can go through and delete the rows. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and label the joints A, B, and C, and so I'll turn on my caps lock and say A, 
B and C, and I'm using my arrow keys to go back and forth between the uh, uh, cells. You can use your arrow keys or you can click. I, I find it a little easier to use the arrow keys. Uh, and then we just define the X and Y coordinates of those points. So we said point A is 0, 0, point B we said is 30, 0, and then point C is 52, 0. Again, I just use my arrows to, to move around. And if you look here at the bottom of the screen, you can see that we've already uh, begun the process of defining the geometry of that structure. There's point A, there's point B, uh, and there's point C. So we're already uh, on our way there. Okay, and so we're done there. We just uh, close it up. Okay, uh, all right, yes. Uh, so if you go to your data entry toolbar, this thing right here, you just click the joint coordinates button and then it brings up this spreadsheet. So if I close this and click joint coordinates right here, click that, boom, there you go. So yeah, so what I'm doing is I'm sort of, Working my way through, oh, just didn't mean to do that. I'm working my way through this list, and so I'm starting with the joint coordinates. Then I'm going to, the, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the boundary conditions. Everybody with me so far? Don't worry, I'm going to give you a chance to build one on your own here in a second. And, and the day uh, of any day is, is definitely a day I want you to be very active in chat. If you've got any questions, please, you know, throw them out in the, uh, in the chat. Okay. So I'm going to close this dialog box. The joints are created. Next come the boundary conditions. Okay. Now, when I click the boundary conditions button, I get a similar spreadsheet. Now watch this. All I'm going to do is press the enter key. Notice how when I press the enter key, it already populates that row with joint A because I'm, you know, I, I'm defining you know, boundary conditions for the joints that I have. So if I press enter again, joint B. If I press enter again, joint C. Watch what happens when I press enter again. Risa gets upset at me. The reason that Risa gets upset is because I can't define boundary conditions for joints that don't exist. So that's why you have to define the boundary conditions after you define the joints. You define the joints first, and then you start assigning boundary conditions. So that's why, that's why you can only have as many rows here as you do the joint rows. Now, let's go back to the, to the structure. So here's the structure. And I got to ask myself how I'm going to define this, OK? Now notice how the uh, for each joint we have three different options. We have a boundary condition in the x direction, boundary condition in the y direction, and a rotation. So if we wanted to do a fixed support, like a, a, a fixed support for a cantilever, we define all three. We fix them all. Uh, for a pin support like A, we're only going to fix two of them, the x and the y. For a point like B, we're only going to fix the y. And the way that you do that is you go to the cell here on the spreadsheet, go to the cell that you're interested in, like A, and type the letter R, just the letter R, and then you can click away right here. And if you notice, when you click R or click away, it assigns that a reaction, okay? So how about this? If I click R here, boom, that's a reaction. And so for this structure, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pin joint A. Joint B is a roller, so I'm only going to have a reaction in the Y direction. So when it's all said and done, your model should look like this. Um, that's probably a good idea because uh, that's probably if you want to follow along, you're more than welcome to. But I'm going to have an example for you all to build on your own here in a second. So so don't worry, I'll give you some time to to, to build one on your own. Um, so uh, so what I've got here is I've got the re, uh, pin support here at A, a uh, a roller support here at B. And if I close the dialog box, look what happened here. See how I've got the pin symbol right there? And I've got a roller symbol right there. So that green line just says I have a vertical reaction. So there you go. My boundary conditions are done. Next come the members. Okay, I'm going to ignore this drift definition. So that's a, that's a design uh, spec uh, as well. So here's the members. Okay. In structural analysis protocols, the members go between the joints or between, uh, I might use the term node, N-O-D-E. That's why Risa used the labels M1, N2, N3, because it's referencing a node, N-O-D-E. I'll use the term node and joint interchangeably, and I might use the term member and element interchangeably. So just bear with me. So for this structure, I propose we're going to have two members, one from A to B, one from B to C. So I'll go in here. And just create two rows 
we'll just leave them member one and member two. Member one goes from A to B, and member two goes from B to C. And if you notice there on the bottom, you can see that the members were drawn in. There, we're done. The geometry of the structure is defined. We have a beam. I mean, let's go back to our image. Here's the beam. Uh, we have, uh, you know, the, the you know, central portion between A and B, the overhanging portion between B and C. We place the joints where they need to go. Really easy. Next comes the loads, okay? And let's talk a little bit about the loads because that's kind of important. Okay, let me go back, go to that slide. Okay, so here's the loads. RISA allows you to define three types of loads for a given structural model, okay? There's distributed loads, which that's pretty easy to understand. It's just, you know, uh, any, any spread out load uh, over a given element. That's pretty easy. What about joint loads and point loads? What are the difference between joint loads and point loads? The difference is that joint loads are applied on the joints and point loads are applied on the member, okay? And when I say loads, it could be a vertical load, it could be a horizontal load, it could be uh, a moment, it could be whatever. But the difference is wh where they are applied, either on the joint or on the member. So if I go back to my original problem, uh, whoop, close the close the little photo here. If I go back to the original problem, uh, here's the problem. This 10 kip load, I'm going to model this as a point load. It's going to be on the member okay so let's 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 do that one okay so let's go to point loads now in order to do this i have to ask myself which member is it on it's going to be on member number one and i need to know how far away from that first support is because i defined the member from a to b and so from point a that's what 22 and a half feet okay so i go into point loads and here's what we got. I got point loads. I got member number one, the direction. I've got the magnitude. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say the magnitude is 10, and I'm going to say that the location is 22.5 feet. 22.5 feet. There we go. If you press enter, you can just hit F4 and delete that row. And there you go. The member load is defined. And I'm sure some of you are like, where is it? It defined the load, but I don't see it. Okay, this is something that's a bit of a quirk with uh, with RISA, and it's, it's not really a uh, quirk is the wrong word. It's actually really a really good feature, and it's the idea of a basic load case. So um, the analogy that I use is if you're ever uh, if you ever use like MicroStation, and uh, you remember the term levels in MicroStation, or if you're an AutoCAD user and you use the term layers, uh, if you're creating a drawing, you can place different objects on different layers and then turn them on and off so that you can see them. You know, I only want to see the dimensions or I only want to see the sidewalks or whatever. Um, we, loads in RISA are handled the same way. We actually have to tell RISA to turn them on. So if I go here, I'll show you what I'm pointing to right here, this button right here where it says basic load case, I'll drop this down right here. Uh, if you see this little red button next to that, that tells you to, to display the load. So you can see the loads are now turning on and off. But you should, if you look at the load that we define, there's a problem with it. It's pointing upwards. Why is it pointing upwards? Well, if I go to the point load description, the reason why it's pointing upward is because it's, I used a positive 10. The loads follow the coordinate system, the Cartesian coordinate system. So that means this load needs to be a negative 10 so that it points downward. Okay. So if all of these loads you see here on the structure, they all need to point downwards, okay? So this 2.4 kips per foot, this 1.5 kips per foot, whenever I define the magnitude of the load, they all need to point downwards, okay? So let's let's define these, these uh, loads. Let's go to distributed loads. Okay, so distributed loads. I'm going to define the load on uh, member BC first. The member BC had a load of 1.5 kips per foot. So that's on member 2. It's in the y direction and if you notice it's asking you for four values a start and end magnitude and a start and end location for this 1.5 kips per foot it's 1.5 kips per foot across the board so i'll just put in negative 1.5 and negative 1.5 and boom i've got a distributed load and i could do that however i wanted i could do negative 1.5 to 6 and you know you can see i've got a, a trapezoidal load i could do uh negative 1.5 to 0 
and boom, I've got a triangular load. I can model that however I want. I'm going to do negative 1.5 to 1.5. Um, and then now what I need to do is define a start and end location. So if I wanted it to start at 2 feet and go to 16 feet, I, you know, it would only define it there. If you use the default value and let those two values equal zero, it just puts the load everywhere. Okay, so there's that load. The last thing that we need to do is define that triangular load. And that triangular load is going to go from negative 2.4 to zero, and it's going to go from zero to 15. So negative 2.4 is to zero, zero, 15. There you go. There's the loading. So, I mean, again, look how fast that was in order to define the structure. And I mean, look at it. We've got the boundary conditions, the geometry, the loads, everything's figured out. The only thing left to do, and it's a very easy step to miss, uh, is the load combinations. So at the very end, and this is going to seem a little silly, what you have to do is you have to define a single load combination and you use basic load case one with a factor of one. I'm going to explain why. When you're defining those basic load cases, like uh, the like I use the or the example I used was like layers in AutoCAD or levels in MicroStation. The idea is that what a what a structural engineer would really do is they would have a separate load case for the dead loads, then a separate load case for the live loads, and then one for the snow loads, and one for the earthquake loads, and one for the wind loads, etc. And then what we would do is break out the steel manual or the international building code or whatever, and we would combine those loads in specific load combinations. And so one of them might be, just tell me 1.4 times the dead load. And then another one might be 1.2 times the dead and 1.6 times the live. And then what Risa would do is it would go through each one of those and tell me the worst case scenario. And that's what I would design for. <laughs> Don't worry, in, in steel design, concrete design, we'll get a lot of experience with this. But for our purposes in structural analysis, we don't really care. We just want, here's the loads, tell me the results. So I just need all the loads multiplied by a load factor of one because I won't change them. You know, 20 times one is 20. That's why I use a load factor of one. Uh, and then that's it. Uh, once I've got that, what I do is I hit the equals button. Now there's two ways to solve. You can either use the solve button up here or there's an equal button. Hit the equal button, hit solve, done. And you're like, that's great. What happened? What happened is um, uh, basically Risa took the entire model that you defined and it figured out basically everything. It figured out the reactions, it figured out the shear diagram, the moment diagram, the deflections, all of it. Let's go through this a bit. Okay, so if you look, once you run the model, a new toolbar pops up called results. Let's just take a look at joint reactions. All right, so joint A has a vertical reaction of 5.4 kips going up, zero reaction in the X direction. Joint B, 55.6 kips going up. Uh, there's your reactions. Uh, I can draw shear diagrams, moment diagrams, you name it. Let me, let's look at some of these diagrams. The easiest way to view the results, in my opinion, is to go to View, Model Display Options. Okay, and so what this does is it uh, highlights what the answers are and it displays them to you visually. For instance, show me all the reactions to two decimal places. Apply. Boom. Reaction at A, 5.4 kips going up. Reaction at B, 55.6 kips going up. Boom. Done. Uh, pretty easy. All right, let me turn all this off. Okay. I, I want to show you something else. Uh, in fact, let's do one better. Let's look at the loads. Let's turn the loads off. I don't want to see the loads. Um, now, now what you're doing here is I'm not deleting things. I'm just telling it not to display it. Okay. Let's look at the members. Check this out. See over here on the right where it says member results. Oh, shear diagram. Boom. There's the shear diagram. If I zoom out a little bit, um, you know, it looks a little well, probably a little easier to see. You know, there's that triangular load doing that that nonlinear shear diagram. There's the point load. In fact, if I turn the loads on, you can kind of see how, you know, how it's generating that shear diagram. I'm just using my mouse wheel, by the way, to, to zoom in and out. Now, if there's two things about Risa I don't like, there's, I'm going to show you one of them. I'm going to go to view and model display options. 
And instead of plotting the shear diagram, let's plot the moment diagram. Okay, here's the moment diagram. Now, I'm gonna turn the grid off and let me let me turn the display off, so it loads off. Okay, so here's the moment diagram. And the reason, one of the things I'm not the biggest fan of with RISA is that the moment diagram sign convention is upside down. So if you draw a moment diagram by hand, you compare it against the one by RISA, the one that RISA plots will actually be flipped. It'll be it'll be upside down. The reason for that is there there's a a, a way a, a, a sort of a theory I guess in structural engineering that if you draw the moment diagram upside down, it tells you which side of the beam to put the rebar on if you're doing reinforced concrete design, and it kind of tells you how much rebar. It. So like for this beam, we probably need to put a lot of rebar on point B. Uh, and put it on the top side of the beam. The way that we, uh, RISA would use what we call a tension side positive sign convention. In class, we haven't been doing this. We've been doing a compression side positive moment diagram. I prefer compression side positive because I think it's easier to go from the shear diagram to the moment diagram. I think it's a lot more intuitive uh, compared to, to this. I get why RISA does this. I've just never really been the biggest fan of it. The other thing that RISA does that takes a little getting used to that when you're doing a truss analysis, it considers compression positive, not tension. Uh, and the reason why is if you're uh, designing a frame, the frame's just a bunch of beams and columns. Priest is like, hey, or the user's like, hey, I'm designing columns and beams. Just tell me the compression in the columns. So it takes compression uh, as positive. Uh, so that's just something to be aware of. Okay, I want to give you all a second to work out the... Um, this next example, but are there any high level questions before we dig into it? Remember, this is the beam that we were analyzing. All right, I'm gonna give you a minute, but I want you to do this beam. All right, so let me make it big. This is the beam I want you to analyze. Um, I want you to take a few minutes and see if you can work through this in RISA. Um, now, uh, if you all been paying attention, let's get some active chat in the room. How many joints should we use to define this structure? How many joints? Two, exactly. We could put joints where those loads are, but it would make the model efficient. Uh, so just use two. Two joints, one member. Uh, I'm defining those loads, the 20, the 30, the negative 18. They should be downward, so that means I need to define the load as negative. X and Y reactions at A, Y reactions at B. I'm going to give you all a few minutes to work. And then how do you delete everything in your current view? Um, that's a great question. Uh, first thing, there, so there's a couple things. One, you can just close Risa and reopen it back up. Or you can go, like, I found that the super, the easiest way to start over from scratch is to go to your joint coordinates and delete all your rows. Uh, now, Risa will get mad. It'll say, whoa, 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 you're going to clear the results. Is that okay? Just hit yes. Delete all of those. And by deleting all the joints, you've deleted all the boundary conditions. You've deleted all the loads. You've deleted everything. So I found that if you want to start over, just delete all the joints. Uh, and then in case anybody's interested, I turned the grid off by using that little button right there. Take a minute and go through this problem. I'll, I'll join you here in a second. If you got questions as you're building it, just let me know. Just either turn your mic on or or um, them in the chat. Can you maximize the structure? Okay. Oh, no problem. That, that's, that's a fair question. I'll give you all a minute on this. But let y'all do some work.
once you all take a couple minutes on this, I'm going to, I'll build it with you. And then I want to show you um, what's going on with the, uh, uh, with how to do a truss analysis, because you do a truss analysis the exact same way. There's just one thing you got to turn on that I want you to be aware of, but we'll do that near the end. And remember, F4 deletes a row. The R button, R, when you're defining your boundary conditions, just type R in the cell, and that'll um, set out a support reaction or, or define a support reaction. Oh, you already finished? Yes. I, I told you, Reese, it was fast. That's why I like it so much. It's so fast. I mean, there are other programs that have some more functionality, but man, it's just so fast to just build a model and get an answer. Uh, and I'm sure some of you are like, well, geez, Dr. Mike, why didn't you show us this earlier? Well, you got to learn how to compute the reactions before you just plug it into the program. What, uh, what issue are you having? What boundary conditions are in KIPS per inch? Um, are you defining boundary conditions? I, I don't know. We'll have to look at it. Uh, let me take, let me, let me get into, uh, uh, let me get to the, the building of it and we'll, um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work through it. Give me one second. All right. Um, so let me, let, let's build this together. Okay, so if you've got this written down, this is our first reactions problem. I'm going to just pull this off the screen and just build it right here. Okay, so our joint coordinates, we have two joints, uh, and I'm just going to leave it N1 and N2, um, 0 and 30. Now our boundary conditions. Um, I don't, re are you talking about the label where it says kips per inch? or kip, uh, kip right here, kips per inch? Um, the reason for, that's a great question. Okay, I think I now know what you're saying. The The reason for that is you can define a, well, no, the, the, the coordinates aren't in, uh, uh, in, in kips per inch. What it's saying is, so if you click this arrow next to a given button, there's a couple of ways that you can define a boundary condition. What what you usually do in most structural analysis applications is just say it's fixed, right? It's either, you know, it can't move in the X direction, can't move in the Y direction, whatever. If you want, you could actually, instead of like a hinge or a roller, you could set the beam on a spring. Like you could say that instead of B being like a rigid roller that can't move, you could say, you know what, I'm going to put a spring right here. And so that's in order to do that, you have to model, okay, what is that spring stiffness? And, and we model that spring stiffness as, you know, how many kips does it take to displace it so many um, uh, uh, so many inches? So kips per inch. So the, the, that's the reason why it has that is, is for if you want to model a, a spring boundary condition. That's a, that's a great question. I get what you're saying now. It took me a second. So... We've got our reactions uh, done. Uh, next thing you know is we define our members. We just have one member from N1 to N2. Uh, and then our loads, we have three loads that we're going to define, 20, 30, and 18. Uh, and that's going to be at a distance of 6 feet, 9 feet, and 7 feet. So 6, 15, and 22. Uh, and 2030 and 18. Okay, so point loads. Uh, 
so we have minus 20, minus 30, minus 18, at 6, 15, and 22. And if I turn that display on, there we go. And already got our load combination defined, and we can solve. Uh, got our joint re our reactions. Those reactions matched what we computed in class, because uh, that was the first example we ever did. And there you can see there's the moment diagram. I can go to view, model display options, show the shear diagram. You know, looks exactly the way it should. Maybe show, you know, no diagram, plot the reactions. And there you go. All right. Before I, I pull up the trust, are there any questions? Is anybody kind of following this? Does this make sense? Um. I'm sorry. Wait, 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 wait. Are you talking about this part right here that, where it says beam? Is that what you're talking about? I just want to make sure I'm, I'm referring to the right thing. You might need to, like, I don't know, turn your mic on or something. I'm not following the question. Like you're ultimately modeling the member as a line from point one to point two, but I, I'm I'm not real. I'm I want to make sure I'm answering it. And members, okay, hold on. Oh, are you talking about this part right here, the render part? Okay, watch this. All that is is showing how you draw the members. But watch this, watch. So if you hit render and hit apply, what it does is, is if I put this in 3D view, if I click the little ISO button on the top, you can see that it shows the I-beam. And all that does is show you which way it's facing. That type of stuff, that's a really good question, and that type of stuff is something we're going to discuss on Friday because we're going to look at the materials and the section sets. But all that is is just how it's drawn. It's not changing the, the mathematical modeling characteristics. Put that back on XY. All right. Any other questions? Because there's something I want to show you on this, uh, this truss analysis. Load combinations, please. So you just go to load combinations, and all you do is put basic load combination one and a factor of one. And the reason why is because recent needs to know what it's analyzing the, the structure for. And so what we're doing is we're putting in, in this class and uh, for basic analysis, we're just putting all of the loads inside one folder or what, we're, what I'm calling a basic load case. And we're saying, Risa, analyze all these loads and multiply them by one. And so we're using a load factor of one so it doesn't change the loads. In design courses like steel design and concrete design, we will use different load factors. Like we'll take the dead loads, multiply them by 1.2. We'll take the live loads, multiply them by 1.6. But for our purposes in structural analysis, I just want to know, like for this beam, what are the reactions? That's why I'm just multiplying them by one. By creating all those loads the way that we've done, it should already be in that first load case. So just basic load case one, load factor one. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I want to go through this trust problem real quick. So let me let me. This is what I'm going to do in order to ensure that uh, 
we're, we're following it. I'm actually going to close Risa and open it up because I don't want any options to, to transfer over. And I, I've, that'll be clear as, as, I, as I begin the model. So let me, let me, let's imagine that we're starting from scratch. And what I want to do is analyze this problem, okay? Now, this problem is a problem that we did in class, okay? We did this trust problem in class, and this was a problem that we did when we were trying to solve joint A when there were two diagonal members. And I'm going to model this problem in RISA. Now, there's a couple things different with this problem than what we've had on uh, the last two examples. First off, we've got more joints. We're going to have four joints and we're going to have five members, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Second, all of the loads are joint loads. Okay. So let me I mean, I'm sure you could probably follow this with a little bit more time. Let me just create this model really quickly and you'll see what I'm doing. So first thing I'll do is I'll create the joint coordinates. So A, B, C, D. Um, B is 60. These are 30. B is 30. It's 15. Okay, so there's the joint coordinates right there. You can see the A, the B, the C, and D. Uh, boundary conditions, A is a uh, pinned, D is a roller. Uh, the members, we're going to have five members, and I'm actually going to label them. So A, B, A, C, uh, and because I labeled the joints with the letters, I can just say this is member A, B. This is member AC. Uh, we've got member BC, BD. Uh, and then member CD. And I know I'm doing this fast, but there's really nothing here that you can't already do with the, the, the data that you've been given. So you can see I'm just following the coordinate systems and, and building that trust. Um, last thing we need are the joint loads. I want to do the loads, joint loads. I've got uh, two joint loads at B. The 40 kips is going to be positive because it's in the X direction. It's going to the right. The 60 kips is going to be negative because it's going downward. So uh, three loads, two at B, one at C. I'm going to change the direction on this one to the X direction, make that 40. Make this one minus 60. Make this one 30. Okay. So up until now, you know, the structure is pretty much defined as we as we normally would. Uh, and then we'll go into load combinations, one and one, and we're good. Now, before I show you this very last step, I know I went through that very quickly, but ultimately it's just options that that uh, that you should be familiar with. Uh, with enough time, you should you should be able to recreate that. Uh, everybody good? All right. Let me show you something. Okay, this is a truss. One of the things that we assume from a behavioral standpoint when we do truss analysis is that they only carry axial load. So this member is only this member AB, for instance, is only going to experience a tension or a compression, right? No shear, no moment. Okay. Now, the way that that, that works from a modeling perspective is we assume that the ends of these joints are pinned. Okay. The problem is right now, Risa doesn't know that. Risa just thinks that I've connected all these members, and it's thinking that this is one big rigid frame. I need to tell Risa this is a truss. The way that I do that is I go into the members tab. So this is the members spreadsheet, so uh, this is where you define the members. If you go, see where it says primary and it says advanced? If you go into the advanced tab, you'll see a, a, a spreadsheet like this. You need to go into the releases and type the letter P and move over in P and P and P. What that does is it pins the joints of, uh, of each member. If you create a pin on the end of each member and then you only load the joints, the only forces that those members can experience are axial loads. So this is me telling Risa, you're not analyzing a frame, you're analyzing a truss. And so when I 
analyze the structure, hit the equals button. And you can ignore the warnings for now. Don't the warnings. We'll be able to clear that up on Friday. Um, but if you analyze the structure and go to the internal member forces, look at the internal member forces, no shear, no moment. And the only numbers here are the internal axial loads. Remember, positive numbers are compression. So member AB is experiencing 42.43 kips in compression. Member AC, 78.26 kips in tension, so on and so forth. Um, oh, I have a, a load that's upside down. That 30 should be uh, negative. So let me go back to the joint loads, make that negative 30. It gets upset. That's okay. Run the model again. Run the model. Don't worry about that. That should the the reason for the warning that was popped up had to do with design because it's saying, oh, do you want to you know design those members? I don't care about design. I'm just analyzing. So member forces. And there we go. This actually matches what we got in class when we did this problem in class. We got member A B was 127.28 kips in compression. Member AC was 145.34 kips in tension. Uh, and then this is the rest of the truss. See, the nice thing about these structural analysis packages is you hit a button, it gives you every answer. It gives you the loads everywhere, the reactions everywhere. It actually gives you the displacement everywhere. If you go to view model display, oh, view render, you go to model display options, turn the, that off. I can actually show what that structure looks like displaced. You know, now it's magnifying it a bit. This is what the structure looks like after it's deformed. I can even get a little nuts and animate it. Um, but in order to do the displacements and the, the display shape properly, you need to model the materials and the section sets properly. Here's my advice for you between now and Friday. I would play around with this. Start breaking out some of the problems that you've done in class and some of the uh, 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 things, uh, the things that we've worked on and just start playing around with it. You know, uh, there's a very low investment cost into building a model. It only takes a couple of minutes uh, and just play around with the options, the menus. Friday, what we're going to do is we're going to get a little better. We're going to look at materials. We're going to look at section sets. And then we're probably going to answer some questions that I'm sure are looming in the back of your heads. Like how do I model an internal hinge in a beam or how do I model an inclined roller support and stuff like that? And I'll show you how to do that, uh, that type of stuff on Friday. We're running out of time. Are there any questions before we call it? Yes. The answer to that question is yes, uh, Mr. Randolph. Is there a different way or a way to quickly compare how different materials and beams uh, will affect the deflection of the same loading condition? Absolutely. You are 100% correct. Um, and I'll show you how to do that. It involves basically creating as many materials and section sets that you want and then just assigning those uh, properties to the members that you're running. But we'll we'll talk about that that aspect uh, about how to create those materials and how to assign them uh, on Friday. But the short answer, yes, yes there is. The best way to do that, Mr. is just to play around with it. And again, for you Apple users, I'm going to work to get you all uh, access as quickly as possible. Again, if you have not responded on Teams, please do so. Like like as soon as possible. I need to know how many of you uh, are going to have issues running this uh, on, on Apple. Anything else? Well, just wait till uh, wait till Friday. I've got some other stuff to show you that I think you're going to find is kind of nifty. You'll like it. I'm going to go ahead to call it. I know some of you all have class at 11, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. On Friday, we're going to continue this RESA uh, uh, demonstration uh, by, by taking this process and improving it by looking at the materials and section sets. That's all I have, everybody. I will see you all on Friday.